The Children of Van Dan Story by Malika Narrated by me, Andrew Miller Upon the death of his father, King Mildar of Elgon, 25-year-old Alban inherited his throne. Though he never expected to return to his homeland, he was welcomed back by his countrymen, most of whom had little admiration for his father, Mildar, according to many. He had been the king for far too long, and towards the end of his reign had grown increasingly unreasonable and tyrannical. He had even banished his only son and heir, and in a fit of rage, revoked Alban's royal status. So for Alban to find himself wearing the crown he never thought he'd get was almost too much for him to take. He grieved but little for his late father. Most of his happy memories involving the two of them were from his earliest childhood days. Mostly, he was just overjoyed to be with his old friends again, and to finally be reunited with his mother, Marika, who had been one of Mildar's many wives. They had been apart for so long that they were almost strangers to each other. But Alban promised himself that he would spend as much time with her as he could. The Elgonites were also happy to have a young, courageous, and sensible man as their leader. Still, many of them were unsure how to feel about his wife, who had been one of the main reasons Mildar had banished him in the first place. This was probably because she stood 165 feet tall. She was Valerie, Queen of Van Dan, and the last known member of her giant race. For 500 years, she had been sleeping under the curse of a giant sorcerer, but Alban had managed to revive her, and against all reason, the two of them had fallen in love. She had taken him with her to Van Dan after his father refused to accept her, and they went to live in her castle. Not having anyone else for company, they decided to make the best of their lives as they could, and Valerie began to gradually restore the castle's rooms and surroundings to their former splendor. It was not long, however, before other humans came to her, mostly poor folks seeking shelter and food. They found her to be a kind and gentle giantess, quite the opposite of the monsters in their old stories. And before long, a new village called Rismark had emerged just outside the castle's walls. More and more people came, and by the time Alban had become king of the neighboring land Elgon, several thousand men, women, and children had settled in Van Dan, and Valerie could rightfully call herself their queen. Now that husband and wife each had their own domain to rule, they decided that the two lands should unite under their common leadership, and that the same laws should apply to all inhabitants. Only a few objected to this unification, as they were mostly supporters of the old king, and having a giant for a queen simply wasn't an option. In the end, they decided to simply leave the land, knowing that they wouldn't be able to face both Valerie and the hundreds of soldiers who were loyal to her. Peace settled over the kingdoms at last, and Valerie and her miniature husband could find some time for themselves, and hopefully begin to raise a family. Their first child came when Valerie was 23, two years after the unification of the lands. It was a baby girl, and they named her Belina. Not surprisingly, she was of a colossal size like her mother, even though she was only half-giant. Valerie had to raise her all by herself for a few years, until the girl was old enough to realize that the little creature she was clutching in her hand was her father, and not some sort of toy. But she managed it, and Princess Belina, upon the age of five, received the title of heir to the two thrones. Though both kingdoms traditionally recognized only the monarch's eldest son as the heir, Valerie decided that her eldest child, male or female, should receive this honor. No one could come up with a good argument against her decision, and it was soon acknowledged as law. Just over a year after Belina came into the world, the queen gave birth again, this time to a son. Unlike his sister, however, little Prince Valden was merely of normal human size, like his father. 
Valerie didn't even know she was pregnant with him until a week before his birth. She'd felt a tickling sensation in her belly, which grew stronger daily, and she'd realized she was carrying a baby not a moment too soon. The birth was an extraordinarily delicate procedure, since she could have easily have crushed her newborn son to death between her legs without even realizing it. Help was at hand, thankfully, and the pair of midwives, overwhelmed by the whole experience though they were, presented the little boy to his overjoyed and relieved parents. At the time of his birth, Valden was small enough to fit on his mother's thumbnail, and she had to exercise the utmost restraint whenever she held him for fear of hurting him. But she quickly learned how to take care of him properly, and she was glad that Alban was able to help her this time. Three more years passed before the royal couple had their third child. It was another girl, and once again she turned out to be giant-sized. She received the name Isilvine, though everyone soon began calling her Sylvie. Now that Valerie had two gigantic daughters to look after, she decided to leave more and more of her country's management to Alban, and to the men who she had appointed the governmental roles. To the people of Van Dan, however, she was still their leader, their protector and benefactor, and she always kept the good relationship she had with her subjects. Apart from these concerns, Valerie still had a castle to maintain, as well as orchards and vegetable gardens, her only inexhaustible food sources, in addition to protecting the townsfolk from attacks by marauding bands of ogres, bandits, other assorted enemies, and the occasional giant bird or animal. Alban was able to help with some of these tasks, as were her servants and attendants, and her army, so that in the end, she managed to cope reasonably well with the demand of her position as queen. She was beginning to tire of her responsibilities of being a monarch, however, and looked forward to the day when Belina was old enough to succeed her as queen. Twelve-year-old Belina began that morning like any other, by reading. She suspected that it wasn't quite normal for a girl like her to spend so much time buried in her books, but she couldn't help it. Her life was enjoyable, of course. She was a princess, after all. But it didn't seem quite as eventful as the lives of the characters in the stories she read. An unknown giant scribe had centuries ago collected a vast amount of tales from throughout the human and giant lands, and to Belina's delight, most of these books had survived, undisturbed in the castle's vaults and libraries. She much preferred to read stories from human authors, even though they always portrayed giants as cruel, malicious, and bloodthirsty freaks. But most giants she knew really had been aggressive towards humans, and her mother had told her that humans used to be tortured and even killed in ghastly ways right within these walls. She was therefore very glad that many humans of today had decided to give Valerie and her daughters, the last remaining giants, a chance to show that not all of them were worthy of resentment. These thoughts had diverted her attention from the book, and she put it aside and got out of bed. It was a Saturday, which meant that she did not have any school lessons, nor did she have to spend hours working in the garden. Why don't I take a stroll down into town today? She said to herself as she got dressed. I'm sure Mom and Dad will let me go alone. I have to be old enough by now. She slipped on a royal violet dress with a matching girdle around her waist and shoes on her feet. It was important to look like a princess, she thought even if she was 150 feet tall and larger than most of the fearsome creatures in her stories. People had to see that there was no reason to be afraid of her. She was only a little girl, after all. She brushed her long, flowing hair and held it in place with a band. Unlike her parents and brother and sister, she had hair of a darker, reddish color. This she had inherited from her human grandmother, who had passed away less than a year previously, and whom Belina never got to know very well. Presumably, the old woman had been too taken aback by the idea of her granddaughters being taller than the greatest trees, or else she might have been more accepting of them. Belina ne was never one to dwell on the past, and she figured she had better go and get to know the people as soon as possible, 
before everyone but her family ends up completely alienated from her. Breakfast was no different than any other day, except that Valden said he was feeling a bit ill, and requested to go and lay down after he'd eaten what little food he could. Belina carried her little brother back to his room, built in a hollowed-out section of the thick castle wall. Normally, he'd have to climb 40 feet of steps to reach his door. But to his giant sister, this was less than a knee-high, and she could simply kneel next to the wall and place him on his front porch. Hope you feel well soon, she said, and she meant it. Belina was very fond of her tiny brother, even though he was less accepting of her. Valden always felt that it was massively unfair to be stuck at such a tiny size, while his two sisters towered above him and everyone else. He also hated being carried around by them, especially by Sylvie, who was still of an age at which she loved to play with her dolls, and considered Valden as little more than one of them. Sometimes he wished he could grow up quickly and become king, even though he knew Belina would inherit the throne, which he also thought was unfair. And sometimes he just wished to live a normal life, away from the vast palace, and with a family who were all of regular size. Valden shut the door to his room and lay down on his bed. He wasn't actually ill, though he did feel a little bit under the weather, and he hoped to sneak, sneak out of the palace to explore incognito. He and his sisters almost never went out beyond the garden walls, except in the company of their parents and he envied the freedom that the boys in the town must have. Belina, meanwhile, had gone straight to her mother after breakfast and asked permission to go out by herself. I may be twelve, but I'm not a child anymore, she insisted, after Valerie had hesitated in giving an answer. I won't cause any trouble, I swear, and I promise I won't hurt anyone, or step on anyone, or break anything, but all right, all right, Valerie said, sighing. She put down the quill she was riding with and turned to face her daughter. Belina, I know you won't do any of those things, and I know you'll always behave politely towards our tiny town folk. It's just... just what? What is it, Mom? Oh, forget it. I suppose I can't keep you locked up in here forever, but... Well, you've grown up so fast, darling. And I sometimes can't help but think of you as a little girl who used to sit in my lap every evening and listen to me read a story. We can do it tonight if you want, Belina said, eager to please her mother, even though she also knew she had long ago lost interest in that activity. <laughs> no, it's all right. I was just being silly, that's all. You go out and have some fun. Only be careful, she called, as Belina had already begun to make a dash for the door. She halted and turned back uncertainly. I know that nothing can hurt you out there, Valerie continued, but there are still some people who have a, shall we say, less than favorable opinion about giants, especially giant young girls. I don't want you spending any time with them, so if you... Oh, don't worry, Mom, Blina repi replied lightly. I'll just pretend I don't hear their squeaky little voices, or else I'll tell them they're being a bunch of sourpusses, and then I'll leave them alone. That's right, Valerie said. Daddy and I have raised you well. Now go on, before I think of some chores for you to do. <laughs> At the castle's front gate, Belina halted and considered where she should go to go first. Down at her feet, the gate guards bowed respectfully to the princess. She didn't know these men at all though she knew that Valden liked to hang around them sometimes, so she simply smiled politely down at them. Resisting the urge to pick one of the guards up to talk to them, she carried on, and headed toward the town of Rismark. Though she could see it clearly from the castle windows, it looked quite different than it did now up close. It was roughly circular, about a thousand yards in diameter, and was surrounded by a thirty-foot-high wall of stone and wood. Several thousand people lived there, in homes of various sizes, and from the town center there stretched outwards six very broad streets for the queen to use when she wished to visit. In the center of a, was a small park, the meeting point of two streams and a forty-foot statue of Queen Valerie. Belina smiled when she saw it. 
To the people of Rismark, this was a great monument, yet it was a little bigger than a doll size to her. As she approached the town's gate, people began to react to her. Outside the walls, the farmers who were working in the field ceased their activities and stared up at her. No one came close to her. In fact, a small group of merchants who were traveling on the road ahead of her hastily made off in the direction of the fields. She made no attempt to head after them, and carried on along the road until she reached the great gate. The guard stationed on the wall watched dumbstruck as she knelt down before them, before, real before realizing that they should probably bow before her. Good morning, she said, and they cautiously lifted their heads. May I, you know, come in? I just want to take a look around. Uh, um, one of the guards answered. I'm d dreadfully sorry, your royal highness, but, but, but we... Well, the queen told us... Oh, don't bother about that, Belina laughed. <laughs> My mom gave me permission to visit. So I guess that means you will do so too, right? Uh, yes, 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 of course. <laughs> you may enter, princess. We'll open the gate right away. Not necessary, she said, and stood up again. Then she lifted up the bottom of her dress and easily stepped over the little gate. A part of her skirt got caught on one of the guard towers, but she unhooked it before she accidentally pulled the entire tower to the ground. She waved to the soldiers on the wall, who were still a little anxious, and then turned her attention to the town before her. The reception Belina got surprised her quite a lot. She had expected the inhabitants of Rismark to either flee from her in terror or fall down before her in obedience. Instead, they thronged by the side of the road, or leant out to, to their windows, seemingly fervent to get a close-up peek at her. Many of them did look up at her with mild fear, but just as many others seemed rather excited to see her. The last time she was here, she was only six and was being carried in her mother's arms. So to the people at her feet, she must appear almost as a new person. She kept her eyes on the road before her, watching each step cautiously, and every now and then she'd stop to take a look around. But she really wanted to talk to the people and get to know them, so she very carefully sat down in a convenient empty space, right in front of the town's courthouse. The populace kept watching her from a safe distance, but she spoke up and asked them to come closer. Hello, everyone, she said, trying to behave in a fitting manner for a princess. I suppose you're all wondering what I'm doing here, right? Well, as you might know, I'm to be your queen someday, and I, I thought I'd better come and visit you learn about you, so so that you won't have a complete stranger ruling over you someday. <laughs> she smiled cautiously, but no one had the boldness to approach any closer. So to save time, she crawled forward a bit on hands and knees, reached her hand into the crowd, and scooped up the unfortunate man who was closest to her. Then she sat down again and addressed the tiny man who was kneeling in her palm. He seemed terrified of his situation, so she laid a finger against his back and tried to stroke him reassuringly. Right at that moment, a stern voice called out from behind her. What on earth is going on here? Belina turned her head and saw a figure standing on the courthouse steps. She recognized him as Master Hillar, the town's mayor, who often visited the palace. She didn't know him that well, though. Still keeping the man in the safety of her fingers, she turned around and looked down at the mayor and his attendants. "'Princess Belina!' the mayor exclaimed, as if he couldn't believe his eyes. "'What are you doing here?' "'Does your mother know?' "'Yes, she does,' Belina interrupted. "'Besides, Master Hillar, I'm old enough to go out on my own now, and I may visit the town at any time I please. Understood?' The people around her were stunned. They hadn't expected so young a girl to speak in such a commanding manner, giantess or not. The mayor mumbled his acquiescence. He was just as amazed at how quickly the girl had grown up. She took another look at the man sticking out, a, out the top of her fist and graciously decided to release him. 
when she stood up to her full height, she looked every bit as imposing as her mother, yet many still doubted that she would make as fine a queen. "'May I ask why you're here, my lady?' one of the mayor's attendants asked. "'Like I said, I simply wish to learn more about you,' Belina said, pleased at being called my lady. "'I don't wish to be a nuisance, but I would appreciate it if I could simply walk around a little. Oh, and sorry about grabbing one of you just now. I know how awful that must be for you.' By now almost everyone had lost their fear and the men and women of Rismark began to crowd around her feet. They all seemed to try and touch the bottom of her gown, and a few of them even began to climb, until they saw her giving them an angry look. One young girl of about sixteen began to cry out Belina's name loudly, and also pleaded to be picked up. The people around her looked at her curiously, but Belina couldn't pass up the opportunity to make a new friend, and carefully reached down for the girl. As the rest of the crowd be kept themselves busy at her feet, Belina regarded the young lass sitting in her palm. She was dressed in the most basic of clothes and was rather dirty as well. The girl seemed to suddenly notice this, and she lowered her head embarrassingly. Pleased to meet you, the giant princess said. I'm glad to see someone who's interested in becoming my friend. What's your name, miss? Arely. Your Highness, came her timid reply. And why were you so eager to talk to me, Arely? I, I, I could be your guide, the girl said expectantly. I could show you around town, and we can talk, and only if your Highness wishes to, I mean. I would love to. Only one thing. If we're going to be friends, you'll have to start calling me Belina. I hear your highness so many times, I'm beginning to forget what my real name is. She put Arely on her shoulder, where she, prompt, where she promptly got entangled by Belina's 40-foot-long hair. She tugged on the strands that were hanging all around her and managed to hoist herself up to Belina's ear. Holding on as fast as she could, she began to tell her giant companion where she thought they were going to go first. Belina, however, wanted to visit the park first. So Arely slid down and landed on her shoulder. They reached the park in a few seconds. But Belina saw something else that caught her attention. Is that... a fire? she asked, pointing to a column of smoke that was rising from the opposite end of the town. Arely saw it as well and gasped. Yes, it, it is. It must be one of the houses in the poor district, where I live. Maybe we could... Hey! Arley found herself being pinched by gigantic fingers, and an instant later, she was down on the ground. She looked up, but the princess was already gone. Belina ran as fast as possible without causing any significant damage. A few large cracks appeared in the street, but that didn't concern her. She was just glad there were no people on the giant street for her to step on. Quick as a flash, she, ran, she reached the gate of the opposite end of the town and, left, and leapt over it. Then she was off in the fields, where there were no more little people to accidentally crush, and she could run at top speed. The idea had popped into her head out of the blue, and she had acted without thinking first. About two miles east of Rismark flowed a small stream, which was about the size of a large river to the humans and the nearest water source Belina could think of. She crouched down on the grassy bank of the stream, dipped her hands in the fast-flowing water, and sucked it up into her mouth. Then she was running back to the scene of the fire. She knelt down just outside the town walls. The burning inn was right inside the walls, up against them. Closing her eyes against the smoke, she spewed out the 700 gallons of water in her mouth, drenching the flames. This nearly extinguished the fire, but parts of the lower floors were still burning. The roof had caved in, and Belina could see all the people still trapped on the upper floor, covered in soot. She rolled up her sleeve and stuck her arm into the smoking ruins, trying to grab whoever she could. After rescuing four people in the topmost rooms, she broke through the floor and began searching for survivals in the middle story. A man and a woman trapped in one of the cupboards were the only people left in the inn. They could see an enormous hand sticking through the ceiling and 
thinking it belonged to Queen Valerie, ran towards it. Then they too were grasped tightly and lifted into the clean air. Belina placed the choking couple down on the wall, while below them, men and women with buckets of water were dousing the last of the flames. But most of the gathered crowd had their eyes only on Belina, who even kneeling down as she was, loomed high above the great wall. It had taken her but a few minutes to put out most of the fire and rescue everyone trapped inside, and she was beginning to feel, for the first time in her life, as if she had done something great. The final confirmation came when the crowd began to applaud, and many of them got down on their knees to show respect. She began to blush, and wondered if she could say anything. I'm glad to have been able to help, she said, as the woman she'd rescued was embraced by her young son. You don't have to thank me. Well, maybe I'll think of something you could do for me, but that's not important right now. I'm just happy that no one was hurt, and I'm certain my mother shall be able to pay for the damage. Oh, I think she could, a voice behind her said. Belina turned her head and saw the queen standing behind her. She stood up, and Valerie smiled at her proudly. So, only your first day outside and you're already a hero, Valerie said. I hope this will be a recurring role for you, dear. Goodness knows I can't do all the work around here. <laughs> I didn't do much, Belina admitted. It was true. What she had done had been no effort to her, and she rather felt that she didn't deserve much credit. But her mother simply laughed at her modesty. No, my darling. You simply saved the lives of six people and stopped a dangerous fire before it could spread even further. And you've proven me wrong about keeping you inside the castle. Speaking of which, we'd best head back. And later, perhaps, you can go and look for your brother and sister. They're somewhere out and about, and I don't want them running into trouble in the forest. Belina nodded and stepped lightly over the town wall, to look for Arley. She wasn't going to leave her new best friend, not without getting to know her first, and thought it might be a good idea to bring her over to the castle later. The people will rush to the side as she moved through them, her gargantuan slippers adding yet more cracks to the road she damaged earlier. But she didn't care about that. She knew that her mother would see to it, just like she always did. Valden was sitting on top of a large rock, overlooking the great river that flowed east of the castle. He knew that his sisters would think it was a small stone on the bank of a small stream. But it all seemed so large to him. The castle was miles behind him, lost behind a forest of tall grass he'd spent hours struggling through. Ahead of him, across the river, grew another forest, this one of real giant-sized trees. It looked very dark and dangerous out there, but Valden still longed to reach it. If he were only a half as large as Sylvie, he would wade through the stream and... Found you! <laughs> a high-pitched voice yelled above him, and the next moment he was dangling far above the ground, caught by the back of his tunic. I knew you weren't sick. Just wait till Mommy hears about you. Put me down, he screamed, as little Sylvie rolled him around her palm with her fingertip. You can't do this to me. I'm older than you are. He scrambled to his feet and tried to find a way down, but she nipped him between her fingers and he was trapped. Sylvie smiled sweetly at him, her loose golden hair hanging down in front of her face. He wished he could punch her right in the nose, but all he could do was glare at her. You're in so much trouble, she said, mimicking his glare. In fact, I don't think I'll take you to mommy at all. First you'll be my princess doll for a bit. And then, if you behave good... Oh, shut up, he yelled. You can't make me your stupid doll anymore, Sylvie. Mom and Dad said so. And if you try to do anything... Hey! Hey, I'm not done talking! She stuffed him into a small pocket of her gown and was holding him down, her finger covering his mouth. Then, pleased with her superior size, headed back home. She knew she'd be punished for this 
perhaps even locked in her room, or even have some of her toys confiscated. But she didn't care. Being able to dominate her older brother like this was just way too much fun. Half an hour later, Prince Valden was, despite his most fervent pleas and protests, was forced to wear a little doll's dress and pretend to be a princess in need of rescue. As he was being put into Sylvie's miniature doll palace, he decided on that day that he was going to leave this place as soon as possible, for good. <laughs>